first of all it's my pleasure to be amongst you in spite of the social distance being norm of the day ever since code 19 initiated a complete lockdown before i start my session i request all of you just close your eyes and listen to my conversation as i guide you through your imagination just imagine all your health parameters were monitored 24 hours 7 days a week by sensors both on your body and in your body at home and at work the sensors will record your body chemistries body temperature heart rate respiratory rate your stool and urine chemistries etc and then important you have jarvis from iron man or an advanced version of alexa siri or google home analyzing these parameters holistically accounting for what you eat how you sleep and any set of behaviors the sensor alarm rings the minute you contract a virus and in turn informs you of the immunity boosting tips and gives you proper public health guidance now we can open your eyes come back to reality had this just think for a second had these sensors been in reality today the world would have been a better place to live with with no pandemic no lockdown no economic crisis fewer deaths many believe this is exactly where we are going post pandemic maybe pandemic is a blessing will speed up the trend of having sensors like i elaborated before today's talk i'm going to give you a short introduction about coronavirus then our government response how we optimized with the existing current infrastructure and how we implemented public health measures and what is the current impact what we expect post covid lessons learned and what reforms we need to establish a robust healthcare system for the future then i briefly touch upon healthcare policy where we missed and how is going to shape our country now today this novel coronavirus has become a serious threat it is like a tsunami and healthcare systems are scrambling to fight it we need to prepare and not overreact in humans several coronavirus are known to cause respiratory infections ranging from common cold to more severe diseases examples of respiratory infectious diseases that are pandemic include in 2002 severe acute respiratory syndrome known as sars in 2009 h1n1 influenza 2012 middle east respiratory syndrome known as mers and now in 2019 we started with coronavirus that's known as covid-19 coronavirus just that you all of you know are a family of viruses which cause illnesses in animals or humans this new virus and the disease were unknown before the outbreak began in wuhan china 
in December of 2019, that's COVID-19, the most common symptom of, of COVID-19 are cough, fever, and tiredness. Other symptoms that are common, in fact, that are less common, that may affect some patients, are headaches, aches and pains, nasal congestion, sore throat, diarrhea, loss of taste or smell, or rash on the skin, sometimes discoloration of fingers and toes. These symptoms are usually mild and begin gradually. Some people may get infected faster than others. Some people may have mild symptoms and recover fast, but usually the symptoms appear anywhere between two days or as long as 14 days after exposure. COVID-19 pandemic has profoundly influenced lives of many people on the planet. It has changed our daily lives. Something as simple as walking in the park is now perceived as, is perceived now very different and is not that simple. I usually admire people when they walk around town, and I don't see them walking anymore. The same is true for any businesses. Many businesses have shut down or changed to accommodate social distancing. New patterns of consumer and worker behavior and expectations have emerged in the first weeks of this crisis. Just to give a little bit of trace history, on March 11, 2020, World Health Organization announced COVID-19 is a pandemic. As the COVID-19 marched through 111 countries in three months, infecting more than 120,000 people. It's significant and all of you should understand that this COVID pandemic has stretched healthcare infrastructure all over the world, even in developed countries. And you can imagine what the developing countries will do to face such a threat. And especially like India, the owners and ownership of guiding India, leading India, taking care of the lives of 1.3 billion people is enormous. That's the magnitude we're dealing with. Government across the world rapidly expanded their healthcare capacity in response to COVID-19. In India, hospitals were faced with different problems. First, we have to deal with people with different beliefs and also people who are fighting the front line, healthcare workers, they're also getting infected. And our health department is over jealous and in an attempt to limit the virus spread, they shut down many hospitals with infected staff. To give an example, Wokhart, Jaislok, Hindujakar, and Beach County, Candy, among others, hospitals were designated as containment zones. They were shut down. Now, of course, this coronavirus disease being new, everybody is learning as we go on. Now the rules are slightly relaxed. And yesterday, as per our conversation with the health secretary, they said we will not shut down hospitals anymore, as long as you follow preventive measures. I would like to highlight another important point. 
healthcare today is basically a sick care. You go to the hospital when you're sick. What do they do? We treat symptoms of the disease and we actually don't look at the root causes. That is, situa that is a situation across the world, not only unique to India, more so in India, but it's not unique. But such a practice prevents us to proactively address the disease that, that might show up anytime. We, in case of coronavirus, we lack adequate testing capacity. We don't have enough tests to do tests on everyone. Right now, we are doing tests on people who we think are suspects for COVID. The best defense against any outbreak is a strong health system. COVID-19 is revealing how fragile many of our world's health systems and services are. It forces the countries to make difficult choices on how best to meet the needs of their people. Thus, COVID pandemic, I can say, is driving innovation opportunities within the healthcare industry. Coming to India, what did we do? Indian response, our Prime Minister's response was excellent. In fact, India's response to COVID-19 pandemic is one of the most stringent in the world based on data from 73 countries. India scored perfect 100 on the Oxford COVID-19 government response tracker. This Oxford tracker tracks and compares government responses to COVID virus outbreak worldwide, rigorously and consistently. Other countries that scored perfect 100 are South Africa, Israel, New Zealand, you won't believe Mauritius, the perfect 100. What did we do? Indian government suspended all travel, domestic and international, by 20th March. On 24th March, India announced total lockdown for three weeks. Well-coordinated action plans were initiated that included airport checking, active health laboratories were implemented all over in important sites to test people with suspected COVID. And we established quick quarantine centers across the country. Our strategy, and I'm proud of that, is that stick to prevention is better than cure. That is the model India followed. Prevention is better than cure model. Based on that, what did we do? What the government of India did the fast-tracked implementation of targets for public health emergencies within National Disaster Management Plan. It is no secret we had a biological disaster plan in 2008. But you won't believe, in November of 2019, public disaster management plan was initiated and put in place. Guidelines are formulated. Before we start implementing that, coronavirus made us to fast track implementation of all the guidelines they were planned to implement over a period of three to four years. We had to implement that on a fast track. And I had to say Indian government did it beautifully. The next one, what we do? 
an intense campaign was created to increase public awareness about hygiene, hand washing techniques, frequent hand washing, wearing a mask to prevent spread of the disease. That was included. That was an intense campaign. You probably heard our district collector talking on the phone when you call. He was talking about hand hygiene, wearing a mask, and like that, several campaigns were initiated all over the country. This will have a positive impact in the short term and in the long term. Then at the same time, we didn't forget the plight of people with chronic illness because they will not be able to go to hospitals in the short run, short period of time, but their inability to go to the health center will have long-term consequences. It was not forgotten, it was put on hold. Then the next thing that happened was strengthening of government infrastructure, public and private partnership that was strengthened. We have to be honest and realize that our health care infrastructure is subpar and highly inadequate to meet the needs of 1.3 billion and above people. In terms of accessibility and quality of health care, our country ranks 145 among 195 countries across the globe. Other countries, developed countries, they spend anywhere between above 8 to 10 percent GDP on healthcare. And they're also crumbling in the burden of this pandemic. And you can imagine how the developing countries will face such a great pandemic. India, for example, spends about 1.4 percent of GDP as public health expenditure on health care. We are quick to recognize inadequacy of the allotment we are giving and the government plans to increase the spending 2.5 percent GDP in the next two to three years. And also the progress has been made in the recent past about increasing the man manpower, increasing the skilled labor in healthcare, and also increasing uh, physicians by opening new tertiary institutes, increasing seats in medical colleges, and implementing expansion strategies. The next important thing that happened, and also lessons learned, is that internationalization of our pharmaceutical industry and a campaign for make in India for more medical equipments. To be very honest, Indian pharmaceutical uh, industry already has a huge presence in the world, is the largest supplier of generic medicines all over the world and has about 20 percent market share. And 50% market share in supply of vaccines. At the current time, Indian pharmaceutical industry shares about 80% market share of supplying antiretroviral drugs to combat AIDS virus and is a significant contribution to the world. Without this, most countries cannot afford to treat AIDS patients. Current crisis, COVID-19, has highlighted the contribution of Indian pharmaceutical industry. You may have heard in the news, US President Trump asking our Prime Minister to export chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine. So we not only released, we lifted the embargo on exports, 
we exported hydroxychloroquine to many countries that can possibly help save thousands of lives. That is a credit to India, in spite of the current COVID situation. Despite being a strongest player in pharmaceutical space, major, a major lacuna that developed, major gap, I would say, that developed over the years is over-reliance of Chinese drugs and over-reliance, especially bulk drugs, like fermentation-based products like penicillin, and also over-reliance of medical equipments like ventilators, masks, PPEs, protective personal equipments. Not only, in, not only India, most of the other countries also rely on China. And all countries realize that no one should rely on one country for all their needs. That is something Prime Minister picked up immediately and he plans to improve our pharmaceutical industry and also how we can make all healthcare and other equipments and products in our country. Already, as you know, many non-medical industries have started making ventilators, masks. I think, as you know, that Tripur makes most of the masks right now. So this is the thing in pandemic situation. Yes, bad. Also, we do see opportunities and we have to grab opportunities and grow. Now, what is happening in healthcare? What is the immediate current impact? Historically, health healthcare has been relatively immune from recessions. People get sick, good or bad. They have to seek medical care. Irrespective of pandemic, non-pandemic, irrespective of the business cycle, the economic crisis created by COVID is too much and COVID-19 recession is shaping, up, is shaping up to be different. Just talk about recession. There are two types of recession. V-shaped and U-shaped. Just that you know, V-shaped recessions are short. Recovery follows rapidly from the downturn. U-shaped recession, recession has a longer period before recovery. To give an example, the recession of 2007-2009 was a U-shaped recession. Like I said earlier, V-shaped recessions are much are less memorable and shorter. We hope that COVID-19 turns out to be a V-shaped recession. We can come out fast, start our developmental activities and build a robust country as a whole. And also we have to realize that economy will not regain its footing unless the healthcare crisis is addressed and controlled. Being working in the hospital, I can tell you what happened here. When the lockdown was implemented, we were allowed to see patients only on emergencies, only life and death. Meanwhile, we had to increase the manpower, increase all the safety equipments that increases the cost. Our outpatient visits was totally none. None. What happens to patients who had to visit doctors? So patients with chronic illnesses, their visit were canceled, they have to stay home. Routine surgeries were canceled. Hospital occupancy came down to less than 20%. But did our expen expenses go down? No. 80% of cost is fixed expenses, salaries, electricity bills, 
taxes remains the same. We have to bear everything. So the other day, we had a, were fortunate to have a meeting with the Prime Minister's office, with some hospitals around the country. We highlighted that many of hospitals may find it difficult economically for survival because they have to pay salaries for their staff at this time and also they had to pay all other bills and um, another thing we requested was about not shutting down the hospitals on for uh, simple reasons and it is in progress and uh, actually they made very good progress coming back to our current reality now the lockdown is getting relaxed we are able to see patients who can come but there is no public transportation lack of public transportation affects our own staff coming from areas beyond say 20 kilometers because we do send our vehicle to bring our staff to our hospital that is the current situation and what is the silver lining you see that people who are not able to come to the hospital because of the shutdown will come back sometime later they will reschedule their appointments and scheduled surgeries will go on eventually and eventually we hope to regain our economics economics and regain what we lost during this time to a certain extent but when you look at other industries like restaurants and entertainments which may never recoup what they lost now what do we expect to happen post covid what lessons we learn one of the significant lesson we learn in our current healthcare situation is to be prepared for the world after covid-19 pandemic the nature of work will probably be vastly different for the next couple of years at least what can we expect once the crisis blows over or becomes manageable think about working from home we may create a category of people healthcare workers who can work from home and their job profile job description will change home care services will hospitals will get involved in home care service and also i foresee reemergence of home visits you may recall in villages uh, the general physician makes house calls that may happen again there is a fancy name for it it's called concierge medicine that is why is it important during this pandemic people realize the value of having regular access to their primary care physician it encourages the people to get routine care and maintain their healthy lifestyle this factor along with new found appeal for social distancing create a perfect platform to start a new branch of medicine called concierge medicine let me explain what concierge medicine is a physician has a limited number of patients he is gets a retainer fee and he is responsible for the group of patients he takes care those patients can call him any time any visits they have to make he will organize or he will make house calls it does two things to the patient patients are not inconvenienced when they have to seek seek care irrespective of shutdown or no shutdown they don't have to wait long hours the emergency rooms and they don't have to look up the books or search the internet to find out who is the best specialist they have to go this physician personal physician will help them 
and more than that they don't have to worry about meeting a specialist or an unknown doctor who doesn't know anything about their history because this personal physician concierge medicine physician will know everything about you i see that there is a potential for growth of that the next one is more important is medical experts and most senior scientists are already looking for major changes that are guaranteed to become healthcare and technology future that is from sudden interest in telemedicine that to include administrative movements of human resource management use of geo location to follow traces is going to happen and more calls from patients to primary care physicians going to increase many healthcare systems are already moving to self triaging of mobile apps to assist their population with checking for symptoms before requesting time with a specialist think about it telemedicine social distancing and self quarantine have forced people to switch from visiting their doctor clinic to consulting them online so i see a future for increase in online consultations not only for patients look at the other angle tele assessment and e medicine empowers healthcare workers to work from their own homes then comes digital health that is going to be a priority then he ask me what is about digital health digital health includes mobile health health information technology wearable devices telehealth telemedicine more than that personalized medicine this pandemic has highlighted immense value of telehealth it may be an impetus to increase the use of technology in making various clinical decisions and also making medicine more accessible and efficient covid-19 pandemic which is probably is not going to disappear in the near future it is a a beckoning call for the healthcare system throughout the world it is time we prepare ourselves with well well equipped artificial intelligence that's going to catch up very fast look at the other interesting angle convergence of biology and technology biology and technology will have an immense impact on systems to identify diseases earlier and with precision more interestingly treatment will be based on patient's genetic makeup so there is no ifs and buts accuracy is the key it will be facilitated by combination of biology and technology that is the future coronavirus pandemic is also a wake up call from the future for administrators across the globe not to cut down expenditure on research and development another important industry is that pharmaceutical industry how is how is it helping our people already pharmaceutical industry started delivering medications home from the start of the pandemic older adults and individuals with underlying medical conditions are warned not to leave home ask them to self quarantine 
Unfortunately, this category of people are most likely to have more number of prescriptions are more likely to get more medicines. So home delivery of pharmaceutical medicines are going to increase. The industry will find ways to enhance that. As the delivery model expands, we have to address legal, ethical, privacy, and patient protection concerns. This is highly important for social well-being of everyone. It is a social thing, not just delivering medication. This needs a lot of attention. How do we achieve this? Of all the things I elaborated earlier, how do we develop a system like we want and what types of reform we need? We have to focus on that. I'll give you five steps. First, India's public health financing has to increase from 1.25% of GDP. And government now expands to expand that by 2.5, another two to three years. Along with that, I request that the state governments also increase their share of spending to 8% of their budget. And moreover, the investments we make, public and primary health should get priority. Remember, prevention is our best bet. We must designate a nodal point in the central government and in the state government for leading and coordinating disease surveillance, informing the citizens immediately the beginning of any infectious disease catastrophe. Our honorable prime minister announced that 20% of GDP he allocated to fight the current COVID-19 crisis. Excellent move indeed. Second, we must focus on operationalizing the network of health and wellness centers. Third, we have to improve disease surveillance and response method. We have to establish a coordinated partnership, both private and public. Number four, investments in data and technology is an important part. India must create institutions and both regional and state. We have to create robust centers to do this and make huge investments. Number five, health system reform will be incomplete without accelerated efforts for developing new vaccines, diagnostics, and drugs. Multidisciplinary research units have to be set up, and we should share data not only within India, we should share data in the international platform for the benefit of the humanity. Do you have time or running out? Two minutes? Sir, we can go ahead, okay. as you wish. Okay. Please. I want to briefly touch upon health policy so that people are aware of where Please. we went wrong, health policy wise, what we need. Please, sir. Yes. And uh, Indian health policy was not well thought of, well established, to be very frank. Uh, some of you may know pre independence in 1943 under British rule, a health committee was established. It's called Bohr Committee, B-H-O-R-E. And the purpose of the committee is to assess the health of the population in India and how the inefficiencies crept in because of their nutritional status, because of the spread of more infectious diseases. So the committee was headed by the chairman was Sir Joseph William Bohr. He was a committee chairman. Other members were le leading healthcare experts. So they met frequently over a period of two years. 
and then they came up with recommendations. Recommendations are excellent. First, they said, you know, if there is a population more than 20,000, 20 to 40,000, they should have a primary health care center with two doctors, primary care doctors, with midwives, nurses, pharmacy, and also social workers connected to the primary center. Second stage, they felt there should be a 75 bed inpatient bed primary center manned by appropriate specialist and later establish regional centers. This was the plan. Then they also said medical education has to be streamlined. They suggested abolition of LMC, it's called licen licentiate in medical practice. That was abolished. That they did. It was abolished creation of MBBS. That was done. Third one was the reporting of infectious diseases should be accurate, should be shared immediately. Surveillance system. So that was in 1943, uh, results published. And then 1952, independent, after independence, our government established few centers and was not well run or uh, whatever. We missed on that. Then Indian healthcare policy, uh, it's not until 1983, we adopted a formal official national health policy. Most of uh, the health policy was left to the states and was included in their five-year budget. So if you check the health care in rural areas, even around Coimbatore, you leave Coimbatore out of Coimbatore, you see that it's a par. If you assess what is the assessment after board committee recommendation. It's not pretty. Had we established that, we could have had a much better system to fight coronavirus. We could have identified every citizen would have been screened. It's just a thought. So now our current prime minister is very aggressive. He has come out with a policy and he has come out with clear-cut mandate that we are going to increase healthcare spending is a priority and health of the population is a priority and is bent on doing that. I'm saying that because we had a national meeting on that. So he is bent on that. I think at this time we are on the current and the right path. Having said that, I want to make my conclusions. I'm running out. There is absolutely no question that coronavirus pandemic will require rethinking of our priorities, reorientation of our strategies, underlying our market dynamics of recovery, and eventually we'll have a normal new life. The healthcare sector is at the epicenter of this unprecedented global pandemic challenge. The private sector has risen to this occasion by offering full support to the government in all areas. In fact, we have to realize that this pandemic is a generation changing event. However, it has also highlighted significant areas where we can learn lessons from. Lessons that will perhaps help, help health systems of future and accordingly the society can benefit from that. Wish you all corona free life. Live and let live. Thank you very much. It has been a pleasure. Now if you have any questions, if I can add uh, doubts, anything you can ask me. Dr. Narayan. So thank you very much for a very comprehensive and wonderful presentation. Uh, you just took us through what is happening in healthcare industry. Thank you very much. Sir, shall we take up a couple of questions from the student side to begin with? Sure. Students, please. Good morning, sir.
good morning yeah. sir go ahead so what's your view on a uh, allocation of 4000 crore in uh, developing uh, or growing medicinal herbs recently our uh, finance minister has announced that there will be separate allocation of funds for uh, developing business over uh, medicinal herbs that exactly the details i don't know that there is an allocation they talk the concrete uh, structures and uh, guidelines i am not aware of that yet okay sir thank you sir i am lokesh from dj academy yes sir many of the industry are talking about cost cutting exercise yes for hospital what kind of cost cutting exercise you will be doing can you okay i can answer that because i am doing that cost cutting in healthcare this is not the right time to do it because we need a full manpower and we need skilled people to help people suffering from coronavirus or suspected coronavirus what we do we don't cut costs actually our cost has gone up so we didn't uh, get it of anybody because of cost cutting that's all i can tell you i don't think cost cutting is going to be very successful in healthcare at this time and in fact i see that there is an opportunity for others to enter healthcare because healthcare as i said is more or less kind of recession proof industry yeah they are good good or bad <laughs> goes on am i right Right. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> so, for our your students, if any one of you are interested in healthcare management, yeah, and you are committed and you are very passionate about it, yeah. I would suggest that you will take up some healthcare related work and be good yeah. at it. Yes, and with your sure. financial uh, experience and training and yeah. public relationships, you can do a lot. Yes. That is, that's why we created a course for doctors. Eventually, our yeah. aim was to include non-medical people in that program. Yes, yes. That is again a future we plan to expand as the time goes on. We'll see how far we can go in that. That yes. healthcare and management has to be combined. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Good morning, sir. This is Dr. Savitri from DJ Academy, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, India is one of the most popular uh, destination for medical tourism. Uh, how has this COVID uh, impacted medical tourism? Medical uh, right now, medical tourism is halted completely off because all the airlines are cancelled. Uh, each and every country is fighting their own war against uh, covid so we don't expect medical tourism is to perk up for uh, another 8 to 12 months at least so it is affected and uh, india being the largest uh, has a larger share of medical tourism so that business is affected and is going to be like that for another 8 to 12 months at least thank you sir Murugesh Pandey, please. Hi, uh, sir. Uh, yeah. Sir, good morning, sir. This is Murugesh, alumni of GJM, and uh, in fact, it was a very insightful presentation, sir. So, being in healthcare, it definitely walked us through uh, what is the current scenario out there. I have few questions, to, uh, qu questions, sir. So, first question to go with this is, say, being in healthcare industry, once I we personally understand that the facilities across India is not uniform. If you come to south, the healthcare facility is far better than when you go to the northeastern and the northern part of uh, India. so is is that you have any any ideas that how can you have a uniform spread of healthcare facility across the country so this is first question uh might be i can uh, i can can i say you the question sir or uh, how is that sir sure yeah fine uh, okay sir well, so I can answer is, one by one whatever way you want 
Yes. Okay, sure. Yeah. So this is first one. So the second one is uh, say currently uh, with the COVID crisis, it has really taught us a tough lesson that uh, even you you walked us through of the whole, uh, GDP spend of India. Like say we are currently at one point nine percent, which is very very low for this one point three billion population. Even countries like developed countries like US, UK, who are at twelve percent of their GDP, have struggled at this point of time. So being at the healthcare and being at such an experienced person, you would definitely have some number in mind. Like say for this one point three billion. this should be the gdp spend so what is that that you have in mind sir that is my second question my yes. final question would be uh, it's a bit of a controversial uh, political question but i really wanted to hear from you that is uh, uh, when we when we are there in the healthcare uh, sector we always speak about this aishman bharat so whether this aishman bharat is a boon for the it a uh, boon for the people of course it might be a, a it's a different opinion but how will a private hospital gets impact because of this aishman bharat these are my three questions sir okay first across the country what can you do a uh, perfect example kerala had a good system it probably you know about that a good system they were able to manage better than any other part of this country and the perfect system was uh, developed in singapore that was uh, following an h1 n1 uh, pandemic what they did was they created a regional center a 350 bed hospital they created that center and within two months this came up when it came up what they did was they isolated all cases of uh, uh, covid 19 they decided all such cases will go to only one center entire center is dedicated to that answer to your question is we have to have well dedicated regional centers like this one so we'll be able to manage any future pandemic or any infectious diseases that are highly contagious that will cause serious healthcare issues to people there's two things one you are isolating and giving the best care and we are not ignoring people with other chronic illnesses they also need care but that care will go to other hospitals so regionally we can establish hospitals like that that will be perfect in times of need that hospital will function as a specialist hospital other times they will be functioning as regular hospital that's the best kind of thing we should have <laughs> second one about gdp about gdp you have spent a lot of about close to 17% gdp on healthcare do they have a robust system i lived in us for a long time even there the gaps are more end of the day what counts is the will of the people people who work in healthcare industry their dedication and passion and the interest of the public and their involvement considering india's gdp population i think our gdp should be at least 12 initial stages and as we move along as we improve our public health measures hygienic measures we can gradually cut that down to 8 that's my personal opinion may be correct may not be correct It's absolutely opinion and then coming to the third question the government sponsored let me let me be very honest with you government sponsored programs they are started with well intention and as you know it's not run well because if it it should really go to people you need it and that's not the case people who have money also use the system what happens finances are draining people who really need it are not getting it so it is time that it is linked to other cards for example we have other card and they are economic status and then instead incentivize those people to go and get health care and reimbursement structure also has to be revived because the quality and care we provide cannot be recovered from the reimbursement we get from those insurers so that's something we have to work on on the political side absolutely Yes, sir. Sir, uh, might be uh, one more question, if in case if you have some time, sir. Uh, yeah. See, uh, I, this has always been in my mind when I come to Coimbatore. This is very specific to Coimbatore, actually. 
So yeah. if you see uh, Chennai or any other places, even the tier two, tier three cities, is, there are corporate hospitals that are coming up very strongly. But when you see Coimbatore, it is always the district-based hospitals. Like say, GKNM is very strong, KMCH is very strong, PSG is very strong, Ramakrishna is very strong. So there are new no no corporate hospitals willing to come inside and set up a shop here. Like say, it might be an Apollo kind of thing or a Fortis kind of thing. So it is one thing which has always been pricking me. Say, what is that? What is that we are doing in a better way that these guys are thinking double, uh, say twice before setting up a shop here? Sir? This has always been in my thought. I will ask you, sir. This was this question was asked me in uh, Chennai and other areas, Mumbai, and they themselves answered that. I'll give you that answer. <laughs> they said. Coimbatore is a place, unless you are a native of Coimbatore guy, Coimbatore communities are locked. Okay. That is, the local community is locked to particular areas and particular hospitals. Infiltration by external forces <laughs> cannot happen. That's what they told me. That person was trying to get into Coimbatore to do hospital business. <laughs> is that he told me. <laughs> Perfect. Sir, uh, sir to put it in to put it in management parlance, you people yeah. have created enough entry barriers for others. Yes, got it. <laughs> entry I, barriers I, are very. I, I, I think I strongly believe in healthcare. Coimbatore lead. Yeah. All hospitals in Coimbatore give good care, and yes. uh, technology is very well advanced, and physicians yeah. are highly skilled. That is yeah. the uniqueness of Coimbatore. We yes. already yes. have that. And for a person yes. to come in from outside yeah. and do everything all over, it's going to be tough. Yes, yes. True. Very true. Sir. So thank you so much. Sir. It was highly insightful. And I work for Siemens Healthcare. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, sir, I do have a question. Yes. Yeah. Now, relatively speaking, uh, of course, our country seems to be doing far better than the rest in the world either in terms of number of positive cases or in terms of number of deaths too. Uh, of course, number one, the credit goes to the kind of steps which we have uh, taken up well in advance uh, before we, we got affected. That's number one. Number two, predominantly people keep telling the kind of immune system which our people do enjoy. Uh, how does your take on that, friends? That, that is simple because we are exposed to a lot of infectious diseases, right? So, our body develops immunity. Eventually, yes. what is happening, even COVID-19, Yes. Uh, we, we don't have established treatment. None of the treatment has proved correct. Still trials are going on. We don't yes. have a vaccine. Eventually, how we are going to prevent ourselves is developing our own immunity. That yes. is what is going to happen when the lockdown yes. is over. Asymptomatic yes. people will infect somebody else. They may have mild disease and they get immunity. And if one other treatment that's being advocated and tried in some areas is take uh, blood from patients who already had coronavirus and take the yes. plasma, plasma transfusion, that is shown yes. to help. So that's how the immunity is attained. Yes. yes. So yes. Another thing they're also saying that India is a hot country, mm. so hot, and uh, that helps to kill the virus. So okay. this hot is going on. Right, right, right. Okay. 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 Uh, yes, 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 yes. Sir, my, my another question, this is with reference to the lockdown. Of course, now we yeah. are into phase three, and we are likely to go towards uh, phase four also, but with the last lots of relaxations. That is what the government has indicated. But at the same time, that number of positive cases is also on the rise. From the physician's perspective, how do you look at this lockdown for with a lot more relaxations? On the healthcare side, what I have to worry about that I'll be seeing a lot of coronavirus patients. Okay. Yes. Yes. Even if you test everybody, <clears throat> right? Even if you test everybody, the testing accuracy is about 70%. 30% of the time people who have coronavirus may test negative. Still, yeah. I don't know if person has a coronavirus or not. So potentially, 
as healthcare institutions have to consider everybody as coronavirus positive and make all precaution uh, precautionary measures and treat them that's how yes. we have to run the healthcare institution that applies to all private physicians in their own clinics too okay. Uh, sir, uh, my final question. Uh, do you expect a rise on self-medication practices in the years to come? Rise of medical practice related to coronavirus? Self-medication. I didn't get that. Sorry. Sir, uh, of course, the report says many people with minor illness, they have yes. stopped going to the hospitals right now because of corona issues and other things. And of course, they don't seem to be facing uh, issues. So probably if that be the case, even post COVID scenario, will people resort to self medication rather than going to the hospitals for each and every minor issue? Okay. Well, first of all, patients should not go to a physician or to the hospital for minor issues. They should yes. not take over the counter medication. Self medication is not correct. Okay. Yes. That, yes. Uh, now, your answer to the next question that's important. Right now, people are not able to come to the hospital, they are home. And uh, downside to that is a lot of people I have seen in our own hospital, they're ignoring their health issues. They're not taking medications. Yes. For example, not taking medication, they get more sick and they end up coming to the hospital requiring intensive care treatment. Yeah. So my suggestion and advice to all people in, across the country actually will be to seek medical care for their chronic illness without more delay. Already the delay by two months. It's not good. I don't know how yes. many of them really had contact with their physicians. What we are doing in GKNM, our physicians call uh, list of patients they have who have chronic diseases and make yes. sure they're okay. If there is any suspicion, we have a home health, home health service. Either they'll go and visit them or we send nurses to check them. So okay. that either they do it on their own or we have to do it on our behalf on okay. the safety of the patient. Okay. Yes. More of a kind of concierge med medication which we were talking about. Yeah. Uh, sir, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I'm uh, Sri Raman, sir, faculty from uh, DJ Academy. OK. Uh, uh, before joining Dr. Narayanan's team, I had spent uh, 20 years in uh, pharmaceutical sales and marketing. Uh, sir, uh, when I worked in uh, Ranbag C, we had a drug called Liprolod acetate. Uh, when I worked in Merck, I had HPV vaccine. When I worked in CIPLA, I had a, a mexilatin and a, a, a valsartan, the RNA drugs for heart failure. Uh, right. we, we used to deliver directly to the patient. Uh, the reason is the patient might save the cost of MRP. They get in that wholesale price. Uh, right. Post-COVID and during this period, you see law, the online pharmacies has uh, become very busy. Uh, so post-COVID, do you see a threat where uh, uh, by... Uh, uh, giving a lot of discounts to the patients, uh, substandard drugs might get substituted for prescriptions. It, it, it's it's a high possibility, yes. And that's why I said we have to look at the legal and the safety issues, privacy issues, all those things we have to be very careful about. And the pharmaceutical industry, home delivery is increasing, and you might see a drop in number of retail pharmacies brick and mortar kind of uh, model that eventually is going to disappear. I think mostly home delivery will start, but we have to have strict regulatory uh, constraints so that um, medicines are not abused and pharmaceutical industry, to be very honest with you, uh, just to make a sale, they don't give unnecessary medications to people without proper prescriptions. And also we have to worry about safety of uh, elderly people when somebody makes delivery, you have to really check and hire the right people to make delivery of the medicines to vulnerable people.